Amen. Thank you, Brother Oliver. I've uh, been looking forward to this day. We didn't know we were going to be gone two weeks before this, but uh, you know everything we do in this church should be done to lead people to Jesus Christ. Everything we do inside these walls should bring them to Christ, but also outside of these walls even more so. And if we're not bringing them to Christ, then if they already know Christ, we ought to be teaching them about the Word of God and disciple them in Christ. Because we don't have another purpose in life. This is not just a club or we could be anywhere else. This is God's house. We are God's people and we are God's house. So I look forward to the day whenever we can talk about starting a new chapter of something that this church hasn't done. And that's Faith Riders. And you're going to hear a lot about it in just a moment. And right before I mentioned, I forgot to mention today, all you ladies that came and had those funny looking things on your head uh, <laughs> that were here yesterday at the, at the tea from 2 to 4. And I want to thank you for all of those who were involved in that and all that put it on. Looked like some great pictures that we saw on Facebook. And so uh, I want to thank you for that. And again, remember today, at, we're going to give announcements at the end, but today at 5 o'clock we won't be going door to door today. We'll be doing that on the 22nd at 9 a.m. At this time, I'd like to introduce Brother Mike Stewart to you. He is from Florida. He's the national director of Faith Riders, and he's going to tell you more about that, more than I would ever know about it. I've read on uh, all the paperwork, and I've looked at the videos on, online and uh, on the website. But other than that, I don't know much, except I know that we want to try to reach people for Jesus, and that's what we want to use this for. So, Brother Mike, if you'd come and share the Word of God with us, we thank you for being here today. Here we go. My name is Mark Lyle. My story is a lot like uh, maybe a lot of other folks. Um, my dad died when I was a kid and uh, had a great mom that worked a lot of hours to support us. So I learned uh, to be very independent. There's just a feeling when you're out riding a motorcycle that gives you that freedom. When I was 17 years old, I met a young lady and uh, I noticed something different about her than a lot of the other people that I hung out with. She told me she was a Christian and I thought, oh no, how did I do this? I had this picture that you had to be perfect, you had to wear a suit and tie, that wasn't for me. Yet I was still attracted to her in more ways than just a physical way. Through her patience and, and lots of prayers, she led me to the Lord. I felt freedom and peace like I had never felt before. For several years, I was not part of sharing my faith. I think I was just caught up in what I thought was just the Christian life. You do all the right things, you say all the right things, you dress the right way. That's when Faith Riders came along. Faith Rider Motorcycle Ministry really isn't about motorcycles. It's really about reaching people for Jesus Christ. We found that if you give men permission to love God and other people through their passion, it changes their life. So finally, for the first time in my life, I knew what I needed to do. I simply needed to ask Jesus into my heart. And Romans 10, 9 says, If you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Faith Riders from across the country come together. We train them in how to share their personal story about what God has done in their life. And people will come underneath our booth. And we're supposed to share the gospel with them in three minutes. In exchange, we do a giveaway. And, and, and that literally is going on all over the country. Whether it's Sturgis or Bikes, Blues and Barbecue or Daytona Beach, Florida. When they go and they have an opportunity to see seven, eight, ten people pray to receive Christ in one day, that'll change their life. When people come to these events and they share their testimony 
and someone prays to receive Christ, they don't stop doing it there. They go back to their church. Faith Riders is really structured to help the local church fulfill the Great Commission. When we start a chapter in a church, it becomes a ministry of that church and it comes underneath the authority of that senior pastor. There's something about this ministry that has allowed so many people to really get on board. We've got a big job to do. We've got to share that good news. We've got to tell everybody about Christ. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Hey, great good morning. Happy, happy Sunday. Aren't you glad to be in God's house this morning? Is there anybody alive? Is there any hearts beating out here this morning? Man, it's good to be here. My sweet, sweet wife and I, Diane, we came up from Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, just to tell you, if nothing else, Jesus loves you. If nobody else tells you that, we want to tell you that. Yeah. So, <clears throat> but before I start what I'd plan to tell you, I saw that great video this morning about VBS. Let me, let me give you a little plug for VBS. Through Vacation Bible School in 1979, my three daughters, Michelle, Jenny, and Kelly, got saved. A week later, their old man got saved. VBS is incredibly, incredibly important. A recent Barna survey across America showed that 48% of born-again Christians got saved before the age of 13. We have to invest in our youth. And they show that over 95% of born-again Christians in America got saved before the age of 30. We have been focusing on some of our older adults, which is a wonderful thing, but we have got to reach the youth of America. If there was ever a time to reach the youth, I'm telling you, it's today. That's just a little side thing to tell you how important youth are. You used to be one, remember? Um, Faith Riders Motorcycle Ministry. Wow, I, I, I could spend a couple of hours up here talking about Faith Riders, how wonderful we are, all the great things that we do. We started 19 years ago in February down in Lakeland, Florida. A great, great friend of mine, you saw him in the video, the former national director before he passed away to cancer was a motorcycle cop, and Buddy got radically saved. He went to a church, he heard the word of God, God penetrated his heart, and his life was changed forever. And he knew that this great gift that he had in his heart, he needed to share with somebody else. He started going to a couple motorcycle events, witnessing to people, leading them to the Lord, and they decided to start a ministry in their church. And after a lot of prayer and discussion with the deacons and the elders and the senior pastor, they came up with the name of Faith Riders, F-A-I-T-H. Forgiven, available, impossible, T is turn, H is heaven. We can all be forgiven, and it's available to all of us, but you can't get to heaven. It's impossible unless you turn to go to heaven. That's what faith stands for. Our main scripture is 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow, as some would count slowness, but is patient towards us, wishing for a couple of you to come to repentance. It says wishing for all to come to repentance. And people can't come to repentance unless they hear the good news. And that's what we do. We don't focus just on motorcycle riders. We go to veterans' homes. We go to homeless shelters. We go to children's homes. We go to restaurants. We go to any place where there is a beating heart that needs to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. 
We're a motorcycle ministry passionate, and if you Google the word passionate and see what that is and see if that defines you, passionate about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we do. We do go to a lot of big events. I will tell you one in particular, Daytona Beach, Florida. You may have heard of that little place. We do a big bike week in March of every year. And at that event, Faith Riders sets up a tent that's 40 feet wide, 20 feet deep, and we put a brand new Harley Davidson motorcycle out there and we give it away free of charge. The cost is you need to come into the tent and listen to one of our volunteers three to five minutes of what God has done in their life. We call that telling our story. Over the last 10 years, we have done that 30,426 times, one-on-one, -on -one, and seen 3,626 people say yes to Jesus Christ. That's just in Daytona. Now, we do that in Sturgis. We do that bike blues and barbecue up in Arkansas. We do it all over the place. As a matter of fact, my wife and I just left Panama City Beach yesterday morning, rode 11 hours to come be with you today. But over the last three days, we shared the gospel 220 times and saw 18 people get saved in Panama City Beach. And so that's what we do. We are passionate about telling people about Jesus. I am so appreciative of Pastor Denver. His heart is for the lost. And what you all are doing, going door to door, handing out those cards, we call that leaving tracks in your tracks. Wherever you go, if you leave a track in the little slot in the gas pump or something, wherever you go, when you pull through McDonald's, hand somebody a track, whatever it takes to tell somebody about Jesus. And it's called telling our story. I could go on and on about what faith writers have done, but more importantly, what faith writers will do in the future. We started with that one chapter in 2002 down in Lakeland, Florida. Another church saw what was going on. They wanted to get started, so they started another chapter. And as of today, you are chapter 376. That's how God has exploded this ministry. You're the 11th chapter in the great state of Kentucky. And I am so incredibly proud of what you do. But what we do is tell our story. And every person in this room has got a story. And this morning, if you would take your copy of God's Word, and on the right-hand side, find a little book called Titus. This is a letter that Paul wrote to his great friend Titus. And I want you to focus on chapter 3. We're going to start chapter 3, verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasure, spending our time in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we may be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Let's pray this morning, church. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for Jesus. As we were reminded in worship this morning, we can stand forgiven at the cross. What a great cost, Jesus, that you did for us. 
And as we come before you as a body of believers to do what is utterly impossible, we cannot do it in our own, and we need your help. We need to hear your word and be changed by your word. But Father, I confess I can't preach it this morning and we can't understand it without a powerful outpouring of your Holy Spirit. So Father, I'm praying right now that the same Spirit that raised you from the dead would inspire this text and give power to its preaching and to the power to its hearing and I pray that your people would be changed. And Lord, I pray the Stiftham Baptist Church in Radcliffe, Kentucky would be changed and we could be saved. And I pray this in the name of Christ, that you would be magnified. And I pray this in your name. Amen. This morning, if I was to go around the room and ask each one of you, where you came from, we'd get some incredibly great, great answers. Maybe some of you are from a different country. Maybe some of you are from just down the street. Maybe from states far away. But what I'm really concerned about is where have you come from spiritually? That's what's important. We're going to talk briefly this morning about sharing our story. Some call it, what is your testimony? And sometimes you feel like, I don't know enough scripture. I can't tell somebody about Jesus. But let me, let me remind you very gently and nudge you this morning that when you go to talk to somebody and you feel intimidated and you think they're going to make fun of me or they're going to poke holes in my theology, get over yourself. It's not about you. It's about this word and it's about Jesus Christ. People will argue with you about theology. People will argue with you about denominations. And my recommendation is don't take the bait. Don't get in that argument. What they cannot argue with you about is what Jesus Christ has done personally in your life because you were there and you witnessed it. Verse 3 says, we ourselves were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. I want to tell you that kind of describes my life. I don't know about you. But the scripture says we were foolish ourselves, disobedient and deceived. That was absolutely me. I thought I had it all together. I was in the Navy. I was going for a great career. I was a chief petty officer. I served 12 years on submarines. I had been in Vietnam serving with the Marine Corps. I had it together. I had a wife and three daughters. But what I didn't see was there was five of us living under one roof going in five different directions because I was deceived. I thought, I thought, I was following the Lord. It says we were once disobedient. Now, from the outward look, I had it all together. But this is talking about being disobedient to God. Not disobedient to our parents or disobedient to one another, but I was disobedient to God. If I went over to chapter 1, verse 16, they profess to know God, but by their deeds, they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. God had nothing to work with with me. I thought he did. He said, Look, hey, I'm a chief petty officer. I am somebody. I was a nobody. I was so deceived. It says, enslaved to various lusts 
in pleasures. This is how Paul is describing the way we used to be. Enslaved to various lusts, today, in our culture, when we hear that, we think he's hooked on pornography. This is talking about all kinds of lusts. Things that you had to have. Maybe it's a motorcycle. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's work. Maybe it's a new boat. The things that you lusted after and you had to have it. It says lust and pleasures. Pleasures are talking about the things that make us feel good. There's nothing wrong with having a new motorcycle. Nothing wrong with having a new boat. Nothing wrong with having a good job. Nothing wrong with a new home. But what is wrong is, is when you lust after those things so much that they enslave you. That's what it says. We were enslaved to various lusts. They had control over us. We no longer control them. That was me. I was enslaved. You talk about the coronavirus. I had the coronavirus back in high school, except it was a drinking corona. My drink of choice is whatever was available. I was enslaved to alcohol and pleasures, whatever, whatever I could find to make me feel good. Maybe that possibly describes you, how you once were. Spending our life in malice and envy. When the Bible talks about malice, and malice in general means, I want bad things to happen to you. Envy means, I want your good things for me. So I want something bad to happen to you, but the good things that you have, that new motorcycle, that beautiful home, that beautiful car, why don't I have it? If something happened to you, maybe I could get it. That's what malice and envy is talking about. I want something terrible for you, and envy means I want the good thing for me. It says we were hateful hating one another. The last couple of days down in Panama City Beach where my wife and I were, there was probably 80 faith riders there working together under the tent sharing the gospel. 80 people that have come from all over the country, men, women, young people, various races, different skin color, and you could look at any of them and say, that's my brother. That's my sister. Only the power of Jesus Christ can cause that to happen. Before that, I was full of malice and envy. But once Jesus Christ exploded in my heart and I repented of all that, he took away that hate. When I came home from Vietnam in 1970, after having spent a year there, I had a hatred for Vietnamese people, and I hated rice. I got home in 1970. I was a mess, a mess. Every time I saw a person of Asian descent, I would be filled with malice. I got saved August the 11th, 1979, and two weeks later, I went to my first Bible study, and I was scared to death. Somebody said, come on, Mike, we're going to go to a Bible study at Chaplain Warren's house. He was a Navy captain, chaplain, and I was scared to death. I was the chief petty officer after all. I was supposed to have it all together. I had never read the Bible. And I said, somebody's going to ask me a question, and I'm not going to know the answer, and I'm going to be intimidated. But I went. And when I got there, there was about 24, 25 people sitting in this big circle, and there was only one chair left because I was late. 
It was the last time I was late for something. And there was one chair left, and it was sitting next to a woman who had married an American sailor. She was from Vietnam. She stood up, put her arms around me. I, I tell you, she hugged me, and she said, welcome, brother. And that hatred for Vietnamese melted right there on the floor. God can do that. God can take that prejudice. We throw the word racism around in this country anymore. I don't even know what it means anymore, but I'd guarantee you I was prejudiced against Vietnamese people, and I was instantly delivered right then through the power of the Holy Spirit. It says, verse 4, the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared. How did, how did Jesus appear? The kindness of God, that He would take His own Son to leave the incredible heaven where He was worshipped. Day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute, and said, Son, it's time to go to save a sin sick world. And it says, The kindness of God appeared. He appeared in a manger. That's where he appeared. He grew up, led a sinless life, was falsely accused, arrested beaten in a way that you and I could never, ever, ever begin to imagine. Was crucified on a cruel cross, laid in a borrowed tomb, and three days later, he arose. Appeared over 500 people. It's all historical fact. He appeared to this incredible world. And he did that because of the kindness of God, because he loved a drunken sailor like me. And he said, I'm willing to send my son. He appeared again, and it says, the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind, he saved us not from the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy by the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. August 11th, 1979, Mare Island, California, Navy housing. I'll over back up 24 hours. August the 10th, me and that coronavirus I was telling you about had been doing business with each other all day long. And I was pretty drunk, and I went to a Willie Nelson concert in Oakland, California. And Willie Nelson was singing some songs, and I decided I needed to come down out of the balcony and get on the stage and help Willie sing. (laughs) And about that time, I had some steel bracelets put on me, and I was led away. I was not falsely accused. I was not falsely arrested. I was intentionally accused and intentionally arrested. The next day, Ed De La Rosa, my next door neighbor, he came over, knocked on the door, and he said the greatest words I'd ever heard that I could be forgiven. Ed De La Rosa took a huge step out of his comfort zone to come and tell a wretch like me the gospel of Jesus Christ about how if I would repent of my sins, I could be forgiven. And he showed me in 1 John 1, 9 that if I would confess my sins, that he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive me of all my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness, including being arrested at a Willie Nelson concert. I could be forgiven. 
And the mess I was making of my family with my wife and my three daughters could be cleaned up if I was willing to repent. And when you share the gospel, you must include that because repent means to turn and go the other way. I heard the story just the other night. I was in Cleveland, Tennessee, and a man said that he was born again. But he was still going to nightclubs. He was still drinking. He was still carrying on. And a pastor took him out to lunch. And he said, who do you think you are spiritually? And he said, I'm a Christian. And the pastor said, stop right there. I want you to quit saying that because you're insulting the people that really are. Your deeds, your works, everything you're doing point totally away from being a Christian. You are anything but a Christian. That pastor was willing enough to step out of his comfort zone and confront that man. And he readily admitted he was right. And he repented in that restaurant and truly got born again, just like I did August 11th, 1979. Now, for the rest of my life, Ed De La Rosa will be a part of my spiritual story. Who's a part of your spiritual story? You see, for 2,000 years from the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, people have been telling people about Jesus. Can you imagine if it stops in this generation? Who's going to continue it? Who is going to continue to tell people about Jesus if it's not you? Don't assume somebody else is going to do it. Somebody had the nerve to tell you because they cared about you. They cared about your soul. They cared about where you are going to spend eternity. Somebody told you. Maybe it was one-on-one. Maybe it was in a Waffle House. Maybe it was at a backyard picnic. Maybe it was in a church. And somebody, like Pastor Denver, was willing to tell you about the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And you repented of your sins, and you were forgiven. Just a side note, if the person that told you about Jesus Christ is still alive, within the next 24 hours, would you pick up the phone and call them, or sit down and write a note and thank them, and say, I just want to thank you for taking the time to tell me about Jesus Because I know now my life has changed and where I'm going to spend eternity because you had the nerve to tell me about Jesus. But who are you going to tell about Jesus? It says in verse 7, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs to the hope of eternal life. Let me tell you a little something about the word saved. First of all, let me tell you about everything that Paul has been summing up. He's basically saying, church, he's telling us, you are dead. You're dead in your sins. You're dead in your trespasses. If you go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, we are dead in our sins and trespasses. Dead dead but the kindness of God through his son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit came to save us let me tell you something about the word saved in scripture if I was to walk out here and go on Dixie Highway and just start to step out in front of a semi and the pastor grabbed me by the belt and jerked me back in You'd say, look at that, the pastor just saved Mike's life. No, he didn't. What he did was interrupt death. When Jesus saves us, he reverses death because you're already dead. And he brought you back to life. That's the big difference. That's the big difference. When Jesus saves you, he doesn't merely interrupt death. Because you're already dead. 
Have you ever seen somebody that's dead? The spirit has left them? I've seen way too many of them. But when Jesus takes our dead spiritual body and invades our heart through the power of the Holy Spirit, when we cry out to him and ask for forgiveness, he reverses our spiritual death and gives us new life, and that's why we call it born again. He gives us a second chance. For you golfers, it's the ultimate mulligan. Let me tell you, it says in verse 7, justified by his grace. Don't think for a second it's justified because of what you do. You can be the greatest singer. You can serve this church, and I pray that you do. But listen to my heart, please. Don't misunderstand me. It's important that you serve. But serving won't get you saved. You can be the best tither this church has. It won't get you saved. Whatever it is that you do, your great deeds that you get puffed up about, like I was thinking I'm a chief petty officer, I really got it together. It was filthy rags. Meant nothing. Nothing. God didn't have anything to work with because you are spiritually dead. Or you were. That's what he's reminding us of. And when we look at other lost people, we need to remember we used to be just like that. Please be careful. Don't look down your righteous nose and say, I can't believe they're living like that. Folks, let me tell you, lost people act like lost people. Just like you used to do before you came to know Jesus. But once you get to know him, you want to tell others about him. Because the Bible says we have been made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I don't know if there's any heirs in the room. I know there's three things that are important to know about an heir. One, they're fixing to get something. Number two, you don't have it yet. And number three, you didn't do a cotton-picking thing to earn it. Nothing. We are heirs to eternal life. If your parents or a relative or a friend writes out a will and they says, I'm leaving you $100,000, you'd get pretty excited. You start imagining in your mind, what are you going to do with that money? Am I going to spend it? Am I going to invest it? What am I going to do with it? You know it's coming, but you don't have it yet. And the third thing is you didn't do anything to earn that $100,000. We're talking about eternal life. Eternal life. Where are you going to spend eternity? And once we know in our knower that we have the gift of eternal life. The Bible says that once you confess Jesus Christ and make him Lord, no one shall ever snatch you out of his hands. You have eternal life right now. You have eternal life. And nobody can take that from you. And once you settle that in your heart, it frees you up to share the gospel with the world. Because you don't care anymore what they think about you personally. What you care about is their soul and them spending life in heaven with you. Once you fully, fully grasp that you have inherited eternal life and nothing can change that, it gives you such freedom to share the gospel with other people. Even if they think, you're so rigid, you're narrow-minded. How could you think that? Because that's what my Bible says. It gives you a freedom to share the gospel. It gives you freedom to go hit these other 10,000 homes in this area you want to go to. It gives you freedom to knock on doors and give them a track. It gives you freedom as you drive through McDonald's to tell the young girl at the window, hey, I just want to tell you today that Jesus loves you. And you quit caring about what people think 
You quit caring about if somebody is going to make fun of you. I'm a fool for Christ's sake. Who are you a fool for? Mike, you're radical. Mike, you're crazy. Mike, you get nuts in worship. If you knew what I've been forgiven of, you'd get nuts in worship as well. But maybe, just maybe, maybe you don't have a story. Maybe everything I'm talking about, you're thinking, that's my life right now. I am foolish. I am disobedient. I am enslaved to fill in the blank. I'm always seeking after pleasure. It's like nothing will satisfy me. And church, I'm here to tell you this morning, only one thing will truly satisfy you. And that is life in Jesus Christ. Maybe this morning, you realize, I need this Jesus that Mike is talking about. I need this Jesus that radically changed his life, August 11th, 1979. Jesus appeared as a baby in a manger 2,000 years ago, and he appeared in Mare Island, California, in my life in 1979. I'm here to tell you, he can appear in your life this morning. And I'm going to ask you to realize I want this hope of eternal life that Mike is talking about. I am tired of carrying all this guilt. I'm tired of hiding in my sin. I'm tired of playing Christian like I was doing. I'm just tired. And I need a refreshing from the power of the Holy Spirit. I need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I die tonight, where I'm going to go. And if you can't answer that question by saying, I know I'm going to heaven, I'm going to ask you to come down here this morning and get right with God. And pastor, I, I, I know I'm a guest in your church, and I appreciate you letting me be here, but one thing that I want to say is, if you're not right with God, I pray you never get another good night's sleep until you get right with God. And let that be today. Let that be today. And so I'm going to ask you right now to get out of your seat and say, I need this Jesus that Mike is talking about. Or maybe you're here and you have been saved and you have a story and you have been frozen in fear to share it with somebody. Let's break the ice. This morning, let the power and the warmth of the Holy Spirit fall upon you and give you a new boldness like you have never had before. It's not the pastor's job to witness to Radcliffe, Kentucky. It's his job to teach you and you go do it. And today, we can make a fresh spark. We can make a fresh commitment. And so I'm going to ask right now, Brother, as you play, whatever the Lord is leading you to do, I'm going to ask you to come down front and meet Pastor Copeland right here. And let's get it right with God. Don't let one more day. Don't say, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it next week. There's two critical days, folks. This day and Judgment Day. And the decisions you make this day could very well have a big impact on Judgment Day. Don't let him wait. The Lord is waiting for you right now, right here. You caught up in your presence
Thank you, sister. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm caught up in your presence And I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything More than anything that you can do I just want you Let's sing that again caught up in your presence and I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment and never want to leave oh I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything More than anything that you can do I 
And I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. And I'm sorry when I just sing another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry. When I've come with my agenda And I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I'll open up my heart to you Caught up in your presence I'm caught up in your presence And I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me More than anything that you can do, I just want you. I just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. Oh, I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. Let's cry to Jesus. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do more time. Oh, I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else, nothing else will do. Absolutely nothing else will do, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you for allowing me to do this. Thank you for your word today and God's word. We are excited to start this. I'd ask you to sit down just for two seconds, please. I I, want to ask Leon... Where did Leon get off to? You know, you know, it's called Faith Riders Motorcycle Ministry. But let me make it very, very plain. You don't need a motorcycle to be in this ministry. Now, some of you men that have been wanting one and your wife says no, you're probably mad at me right now. But... You do not need a motorcycle to be in a motorcycle ministry. All you have to have is a passion for the lost and want to reach the lost. And pastor, as the 376th chapter, this is amazing, chapter certificate, this is to certify that Stiftham Baptist Church, Radcliffe, Kentucky, is a chapter of the Faith Riders Motorcycle Ministry. Chapter certificate is official as of the second day of May. 2021. I'm going to pick up this mic so you can hear a little bit better. Plus, that way, the ones that are listening at home can hear. We look forward to the opportunity to be able to serve God this way and look forward into that. And if you'd like to be a part of it, you can talk to myself or Leon. Leon's probably. Uh, downstairs in the security room watching all the cameras and everything that's going on the other guys in security around here and uh, but he has been one of, he's rode in several groups Christian groups and uh, and uh, he's the one who brought this to my attention and I said well you know let's give it a shot because uh, people need Jesus and I don't know if you notice or not there's a lot of people riding motorcycles around this place and uh, we need to get them to the Lord 
and that's what's important. So one of the other things I want to mention real quickly, we had a death in the church family really this last week with Jim Wetzel uh, went on to be with the Lord. Uh, Jim was here with us many years, uh, loved the Lord, and a lot of people's lives have been affected by him and him sharing Christ. He was a great soul winner and a disciple of Christians. And so uh, this Friday, we're uh, going to have that service. Matter of fact, many of us just sent him cards for his 80th birthday. We were gone. We got back and got the mail, and he had written, handwritten a thank you for that card, and we got it in the mail when we got back. Uh, one of the last things he probably wrote before he went on to be with the Lord. And uh, you want to be here at 1, one o'clock. There will be a visitation time before that. I believe that's all up there on the screen that you can see. And then also at Nelson Bennett on Thursday evening. There will be a meal following the service here. Uh, it's one of the first times we've done a, a full-blown meal for a, for a big group since COVID. Uh, so we'll be in the gym and the cove downstairs uh, for that. A lot of other things going on this week. Check your bulletin out. But before we dismiss, I have a brother here, Brother Troy. He's, gonna, he's been coming to this church for quite a while. And uh, he's, he's part of uh, Corey's home group and uh, and uh, been going to that and been coming here. He wants to become a member of this church and uh, wants to follow in believers' baptism. And so... Uh, we praise God for that. And we had had two baptized two weeks ago, and I believe we got three more to, that we need to set up a time to baptize in the next week or two. And uh, we praise God for that and what God's doing in our church. And uh, he's not as young as he looks, but he is pretty young, and we thank God for those that come here to be with us. And uh, we thank you for that. I'm going to ask you just to stand over here, if you would, and if people would come by and just welcome him into the church. We don't do like we used to do. And slobber and spit all over each other and everything, but we do want to go by and, and tell him hi. Brother Mike, would you and your wife come over by the door over there, if you would, and we'll be over there in just a second and let people go by. I want to thank you all for being here. If you are a first-time visitor, I, I don't think we have enough for the whole motorcycle bunch, but if some of you want to get some, you can take what you can over here by the cross. We have some things we'd like for you to remember your visit with us. Uh, it was great having you all here today. I want to thank Brother Mike again. Shared the gospel very plain and simple. Folks, we're all about not only coming to know Jesus, but telling other people about Jesus. There's no other reason to be on the face of this earth except to give all of us, ourselves, to God and to tell other people about Jesus. So uh, I want to just thank everybody for coming today. I'm going to say a little short word of prayer will be dismissed. Come by and thank Troy for being a part of this uh, body of believers as he's a part of us now. And then uh, come on by as you, as you go on out. Remember the offering boxes on the outsides and then here on the plates. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. Father, we just pray that you would bless this time today. Father, I pray that if there's someone that's there that are kind of on the fence right now, Father, I pray your Holy Spirit would hone in on their heart that they might come to know you. I pray that they'll talk to somebody before they leave this building this morning. And Father, I pray that they would come to know you. Father, for us that know you, that we'll live closer to you, and that we give ourselves completely to you, that we'll become who you created us to be in you. And, Father, we want to give you all the glory and all the praise. And these things we ask in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.